Hello, today I want to talk about news. What's the future of news? What's going to happen as more and more people read news, as more and more newsworthy items are covered, as we have new technology to create and disseminate news? Is it going to be believable? Is it going to become as important or less important? So, I have a couple thoughts on this, and partly because I'm in the news business. But I think that news will continue to be an important, play an important role in our society, that we will figure out how to make it more trustworthy than it has been maybe recently. And more importantly, um, news and learning and information will continue to become a major driver of progress in our society. So, let me just um, start off with uh, the fact that um, it used to be that the technology for collecting, disseminating, and printing news was very expensive and only a few people could afford to own it. And in some ways they had a kind of a bottleneck on what we heard. So, um, the printing press and things like that were extremely expensive and they were extremely rare, which meant that they were capital intensive, which meant that rich people basically owned them and they could use those printing presses to disseminate a view. And of course, governments could do the same thing. They were a type of wealth and governments could also own printing presses and they could, in some ways, manage the news. The huge revolution that we've seen in the last 30, 40 years is that the technologies for collecting, disseminating, and producing news have become almost free. And that has unleashed a huge amount of creativity, innovation, and bad news. So that will continue, that trend of the democratization, the kind of flattening of the ability to get access to the instruments of newsmaking will continue to increase so that basically everybody will have a opportunity to become a newscaster if they want to. That's good news and bad news. The bad news is that there's many people who aren't as reliable as they should be and so we have to have new technologies of trust in order to filter out the trustworthy news makers. And that uh, movement towards increasing the ability to make news will continue. And so what it has meant is that originally only a few people could be newspapers or radios um, to where many people could, but the model in the beginning was the same thing where you are the publisher, you are the owner, you are the newspaper, you are the broadcaster, and you hire your reporters, and they go out and they find the news and they process it and then report back. But in the world of the internet, in the last 20 years, we've seen this complete explosion of the user-generated content. So the customers, the audience, is actually making the news and they are they're recording it with their phones. They are making commentary with text and they're putting it out and even somewhat today they may even start to charge money for it. So it's like the audience becomes the producer and it's being user generated. And as we know, user generated content is very powerful on one dimension, but it can also be very troublesome in another because people can make things up. They they may not be as careful as a professional. Um, they may be too gullible. They may be influenceable. They may have an agenda. So we have to have another layer, another new compensating technology that helps us sort out through this that we didn't have before. We didn't need that before because before it was so rare for anyone to own a printing press or to own a TV station that there was a natural filtering going on um, in terms of being able to 
um, believe in, but now there isn't that. That's been removed, so we need another technology to help us sort through. And that's coming on its way. We're just kind of thinking about that. There's many different innovations from rating people, collective rating, um, ways in which we can um, use blockchain to maybe verify the province of a source, making sure that someone hasn't hijacked it and inserted something fraud into it. So there's lots of things on the frontier where we're thinking about how to bring that forward. And I think as we go forward into the future, we'll have some of those technologies that will allow us to better filter out what's more reliable and what's not. So that first wave of the new news was this idea, again, of taking it out of the hands of the few and democratizing it, making it accessible to anybody. And as we know, this also makes it more hackable. Anything that has AI in it, anything that's smart can be hacked. So we have much more of the prospects of people hacking into us, or we have also the prospects of bots, things, uh, not even humans, generating the, the, the news. So it's not just that there's a 7 billion people on Earth making the news, there's a trillion robots making news too, and a lot of the news may be untrue. So um, that's part of it. But the second wave of this movement is, is the use of AI in helping us produce news. So a lot of what the reporting that we do is, that we do is programmatic, it's formula, it's there's a baseball score. You're going to report on a baseball game. There's it's a very constrained thing. There's runs, there's innings, or football, soccer. There's goals scored. There's parameters. And so the reporting on that is fairly constrained. And the news about that game can be uh, outlined in such a way that we could apply artificial intelligence to actually write or make a report about that game. So in addition to all the many humans who are also interested in writing, there's another new entry of having bots help us produce the reports because they're, they can watch every game. And, it's, and in the beginning, their reports may seem inferior to a human, and they would be if, if it's just a human having to watch a game and report on it, they would probably do a better job than a bot. But you could have a bot watch every single game that was played that weekend and make a report comparing all the games. And that's something that no human would really could do or would want to do on a regular basis. So there are ways in which we can use the attention and the smartness of an AI reporter to process and report on things that, on I say a scale, that a human reporter wouldn't have the patience to do. They can do the same thing in business. They can, while a human reporter could follow one company and listen to the earnings report and would do a better job than an AI probably listening to it, but the AI could listen to every single earnings report that day and do a comparative analysis that a human would find very, very difficult to do, particularly on an ongoing basis. So, what we're, what, one of the frontiers in news is using the minds of AI to understand, process, follow through, investigate, and even report and compose words or video as a way of reporting on the news. Again, this can be abused. We can, you can direct or program these to make stuff up, to make it sound like it was coming from somebody who was an expert, but is not. So there's a great amount of uh, abuse that will be uh, created with this, but it also will offer a whole new way of processing news that we haven't seen before. And rather than trying to replace what a human reporter is going to do, I think in the beginning it's going to be used for two things. One is to do things that a human could do but just doesn't want to do. They don't want to 
you know, uh, they don't want to be poor in the weather again because it's kind of boring. But we can have an AI do that every hour and they aren't going to be bored. Or to do something that no human could do in terms of the scales of things or the speed at which things are being done. So those those are two areas in which the kind of the basic human reporting for news are going to be amplified by AI. But that's not the only way in which news is going to change. The um, other way in which it's being changed is um, how it's being dis distributed, how, how we get it. And again, it used to be that getting news was something that we kind of would do in a modal construct. We would be, um, you know, I'm, I'm working now and after I work I'm going to listen to the news or read the news and then I'm going to have dinner. It was something that you kind of did as a focused activity. But what we're finding in social media and stuff is the news is sort of embedded into our environment. It's embedded into um, our daily lives. There's no moment when we kind of like are doing news and not doing news. It's just a background. Almost, it's we could almost imagine in the future this kind of having our lives have scroll bars or headlines floating through any time of the day, anywhere, maybe even in response to what we're looking at. So it's much more of an immersive or embedded construct rather than as a separate mode. We can still, you know, decide we want to follow something, but the general idea that the information and news is coming as a separate entity is going to be blurred so that it becomes much more of a, a immersive or mixed augmented um, mode. And then, um, then there is all the many new forms of media that are being invented right now. The biggest new form that has been invented has been YouTube. And I believe that, you know, videos, I, I, I think in general, our society is moving away from being people of the book, where the book and the text were central to the civilization. And we were kind of formed by laws and scriptures and codes and constitutions and text and authors to a world in which everything's on the screen. We're the people of the screen and things are fluid and flowing they're temporary, they're streaming, everything has to be assembled, there's no fixed authority, there's no fixed truth, everything is sort of a, a stream of different opinions. For every expert there's an anti-expert, and so this world of the screen and the flows um, is moving images, is at the center, and I think the augmented reality with smart classes where we have a digital world is part of this liquid environment that we're headed into. And so in that world, um, there are many, many new forms of media that we are inventing. So we have a basic one of this kind of like, you know, TikTok, Periscope, little fast little video clips that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, would have cost hundreds of dollars to produce each one. Now someone does it for free with 12 year old does it for free with a phone. And right now the tools for editing those are rudimentary and crude, but they were rapidly involved so that anybody will be able to begin to edit of those videos and compile them into something longer. And again, that was something that has been until now very expensive to do, very laborious and time consuming, but the tools with AI and stuff will make it much easier to do that very, very quickly. And so the movement to a YouTube world, a world of video will continue to move and more and more of our culture will revolve around the moving images. I have long predicted and suggested that we're actually going to take the qualities of the text of reading and meld it together, marry it with moving image so that we'll have movies that we read and books that we watch will have text and images flowing together. We see some of that happening with some of the news sites where they use words and text 
You see that with um, music videos, they have the lyrics flowing over them. So there's much that yet to be discovered about new media, and I think one of the possibilities that we're looking at, not the only one, but many of the, one of those possibilities is this convergence of reading and watching together at the same time. And particularly as we get into the realm of informational works, it used to be called tutorials or how-to books or instructional stuff, learning, educational. That's a huge, huge area and where moving images are going to be very, very important in the power for them to teach. And in that realm, I think this convergence of text and moving images will become very important. And particularly as we move into, again, the world of the smart classes where we have three-dimensional volumetric experiences, um, being able to delve deeper to learn something, sometimes text is the most compressed and the most powerful way to learn something. Sometimes a diagram is. Sometimes seeing a video uh, of someone doing something or having a, a shadow puppet that we can actually follow. So there are many, many ways that are part of this emerging universe. And text will still remain one part of that, but it'll be in a way that's not just uh, text on the lines on a book. So I think we should expect even more varieties of media to erupt. Um, there will continue to be short little video clips. There will continue to be little tweets, you know, 240 character tweets. That's a, that's a viable mode that's not going to go away. There'll still be long form articles. There'll be um, 60 minute video investigations, there'll be documentaries, there'll be audio documentaries, which is what a podcast is. There will be um, um, even new ones invented as we move into the mirror world, where we have virtual spaces and three-dimensional immersion. I think we'll have another 20 different media that will blossom in that world. Um, and issues like how do you watch, how, how do you have a movie experience inside a three dimensions? Um, we'll see new game forms. There's the shooter up, there's the strategy games that we have right now, there's the role playing games, but when we have volumetric three dimensional spatial computing, there'll be even more new kinds of games to come out of that. Um, and so I think we're headed into a moment when there are going to be as many new genre, media genres, medias invented as we already have. You know, there'll be, we'll have twice as many in another 50 years, twice as many media genres than we have right now. Um, and a lot of that's going to be coming from moving into the spatial world and having, um, combinations of, as I was saying, you know, taking traditional text and putting in three, three dimensions, taking music and making not just a music video, but a music experience. Um, there are so many new ways to, to mix this up and remix them that, um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll feel sorry for people back in 2019 because we had only X number of, of, uh, media. And I think that um, one of the effects of this is that we're going to accelerate the pace of culture, accelerate the pace of learning. I've been very, very uh, impressed by the unappreciated role of YouTube tutorials in accelerating how fast learning happens, where things are, say, even in the realm of like inventing a new media, someone tries something and the next day someone sees that and explains how it was done and how maybe they could do it better. And then two days later, someone else has taken that idea and improved it and shown it and maybe even someone else describing how it was done. And then the third day, 
someone else improves it again even f better and that kind of speed is one of the ways in which progress is happening and one of the ways that we're accelerating the culture and it comes because this instructional ability of this new media is very very powerful in terms of being able to actually communicate something to someone in sufficient clarity and detail that they can actually do it themselves and that I think is the sort of the meta media going on which is this ability to accelerate learning as a culture that will really make the next 50 years far more amazing than the past 50 years. So that's what I think the new media is going to look like.